start by uh, uh, asking the first question to the panelists. Uh, and this is, from your perspective, what are the challenges uh, in your like, line of work with respect to network security incidents? So are there things like uh, reporting difficulties, you know, analysis difficulties, uh, dealing with law enforcement, and so on and so forth? So starting from the perspective of the MISA side, uh, actually, I will not speak on behalf of the MISA because, uh, you know, I, I have experience during uh, my work at the European Data Protection Authority where we were uh, investigating some uh, cases. And uh, the dimension I will uh, focus on is more on the privacy, uh, privacy preserving uh, during the forensic uh, analysis. Uh, I think that uh, the, more the, the, the challenges in this area is to find out processes and uh, tools also that uh, may uh, support the data protection and privacy uh, uh, combines uh, of uh, the forensic uh, procedures. I think that uh, selective, for example, uh, selective uh, acquisition uh, of data is one of uh, the areas that need more uh, uh, focus. Uh, other uh, areas, uh, I, could, I would say, that uh, will be uh, the balance between anonymity and the uh, traceability and uh, investigation. Uh, and I think, in general, that uh, we have to take into consideration all the data protection regime and uh, make uh, produce um, forensic. Uh, procedures that are combined with this, uh, with this uh, framework. Another aspect uh, which is uh, very important and I think that uh, will uh, be uh, at the top of interest in the next few years will be the cloud computing and the forensics. It has, in my opinion, two dimensions. On the other hand, uh, how the cloud uh, providers may mm -hmm. preserve the data in order to, to uh, uh, be suitable for forensic uh, collection and uh, analysis. And on the other hand, uh, how uh, investigators may preserve their uh, uh, data in a cloud uh, service provider. From our point of view, there are two uh, issues that are very important to cybercrime and concerning cybercrime. The one is, uh, uh, is uh, the loss of uh, um, self-regulation uh, concerning teenagers that uh, are uh, usually uh, use uh, internet and especially social networks uh, uh, in order to publish a lot of personal data and a lot of other issues and they use the internet uh, uh, not uh, so safely as uh, we, we, we need to um, uh, to tell them how, how, how safely they have to use all the, the, the internet uh, the one thing is this, and the other is uh, it had to do, has to do with uh, the legal framework. Um, although there are a lot of cyber crimes, and uh, we, we face in, at Safeline every day a lot of cases concerning personal data violation, child pornography, uh, online uh, financial financial fraud, or communication privacy breach, hate speech, and all all these kind of cyber crimes. Uh, although we have a lot of reports from users concerning this type of crimes, uh, we are not able to do a lot of things with cooperation with the uh, cybercrime uh, uh, unit of uh, Hellenic police because of a lot of uh, legal gaps that uh, have to do with uh, the license in order to uh, have uh, contact details from, from, from the person that they have committed all such crimes. And um, in, uh, in cooperation with uh, uh, Safer Internet Awareness Note, we try to uh, 
uh, inform children, uh, students and uh, teachers in order to be protected while they use the internet and especially social, ne social networks because uh, this is a new type of uh, websites where a lot of cyber crimes uh, every day are committed there. Hello, um, I've just got a question really from, from a legal perspective. How do you regulate in a world that it goes across the digital borders? You're talking about sort of issues with social networks, but the data is actually stored, say for example in America, where local laws don't, don't apply. So how do we regulate? What do we need to do as academics to move that process forward? Uh, I will try to give you some uh, hints because okay I'm not a lawyer but uh, I have worked uh, in the, uh, the, the environment of somehow we say law enforcement because as a data protection authority we have the responsibility to enforce the law as regards the data protection issues which uh, more or less face similar situation. It's a, I have to say that it's a difficult situation for the moment most of uh, the problems are solved based on uh, mutual agreements or uh, uh, you know memorandum of understandings and uh, soft law uh, solutions are, are used for the moment. This is a big issue, especially which is uh, very uh, arcing uh, due to the fact that we are now are moving to the cloud and uh, the different jurisdictions. It's one of the most important issues to face there. Uh, there is no solution for the moment, and I think we have to, the legal experts, have to focus on this uh, aspect uh, now. Yeah, from my perspective, I think it's the million dollar question, really. It's probably the most difficult question to answer, so thanks, John, for that. Um, yeah, I, I guess if we look at what's happening at the moment, we can see some trends, particularly the cloud computing environment, in the sense that uh, nations are beginning to um, introduce laws that bind data um, coming from the nation or linked to any individual within that country uh, to that country. So the US have done it, and in the EU have similar directives coming through. Um, and I could potentially see more of that happening. Um, I don't think that's necessarily a good thing in a way forward, but it, it's kind of the, the solution in the interim, uh, so I think. And uh, the next comment, uh, now it uh, crossed my mind the fact that I think the Article 29 on EDPS has issued uh, a kind of uh, communication, I would say, a, legal, a, a, a text as regards the, uh, the, 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 the regime of the law enforcement in every particular case as regards, of, of course, all the data protection issues. I don't know if there are similar uh, cases in other areas, in other legal uh, areas. But uh, in terms of data protection, there is uh, this um, directive, I would say, uh, good practice guide, has been, been issued by Article 29 as regards the, uh, the law that is applicable in each particular case of transfer of data and so on. Through the Safer Internet Program of European Com uh, Commission uh, that supports uh, the operation of SafeLine and uh, the operation of other uh, 40 hotlines uh, all over the world, um, we try to um, to, um, uh, to to take part in the. Uh, meetings uh, in cooperation with our uh, law enforcement. For example, once a year uh, the, uh, we meet other, uh, in, uh, other, uh, other police from other cybercrime uh, units uh, all over the world uh, with uh, Interpol as well and Europol in order to find ways how to protect children uh, from uh, um, cybercrimes concerning sexual uh, issues especially child pornography or grooming activities and uh, uh, issues uh, that are so sensitive and uh, are the most serious in uh, cyberspace. Uh, yes, uh, I was just about to uh, mention the same uh, European uh, initiative. Actually, uh, legislation, especially international legislation, uh, is a tough topic. And, uh, 
it is a, a very high level to achieve. Therefore, I think before we can reach that level, uh, raising the awareness uh, is probably an easier step to take. Therefore, uh, as we just mentioned, that uh, the European uh, European Commission uh, Direct Director General uh, has a several internet program, and uh, they are funding uh, a several internet center in each member state. So each member state now has a sort of center uh, to promote the awareness of safer internet, and. Uh, they are also uh, running several internet, uh, internet days uh, every year. And then basically this program uh, runs for five years from uh, 2009 to uh, 2013, which is mainly uh, aimed to align the program with uh, FP7. But I think uh, to, uh, 2013 is not at the end of the program. After 2013, uh, the European Commission will uh, start a new initiative called uh, Horizon uh, 2020. And uh, I believe the program uh, will continue into uh, that scheme. Thank you. Um, obviously, I'm not a practitioner, so from an academic perspective, when I look at the field and, and look at what's happening, um, I guess I can reiterate the comment made by the first panelists. We are really lacking a lot of their network forensic tools and capabilities. You know, if I were to map what we can do with file system analyzers and the tools and applications and techniques, um, they're relatively sophisticated and they help the examiner um, achieve their job in, in a far shorter time period than the old days of using hex editors and things like this. Um, whereas if we analogize that and map that across the, the network's domain, we really don't have many tools at all. You know, the, the one I always see in literature usually popping up is Wireshark. And whilst Wireshark is a fantastic tool, it was never designed to be a network forensic analyzer. It just has some capabilities that allow you to analyze such data. Um, and I believe if we look at some of the trends that are happening in forensics themselves, you know, obviously there's going to become um, uh, a decreasing reliance upon hard drive media um, for a variety of reasons. Because I think in part technology is evolving so, such that a lot of the smoking artifacts are disappearing. Um, OSs are forensically wiping data when you delete it. It's not there anymore. And, and kind of the branch of anti-forensics also it is competing against that to also obfuscate and hide and remove data. So forensic examiners are going to find it increasingly more difficult to get out the data they're looking for, and they're going to have to rely upon network forensics. Um, the problem we have with network forensics, I think from my perspective looking at the problem, it, it's effectively, it, it's a data problem. It's a data reduction, data identification problem, and it's about the development of tools that assist the, the examiner in kind of finding that information um, as quickly as possible. Okay, uh, let me focus on uh, the detection of child pornography uh, because uh, that's closer to my uh, SPT. Uh, if, if again we use our uh, European Commission uh, project uh, as examples, the EC is currently uh, funding a number of uh, international uh, projects uh, to deal with uh, the distribution of child pornography. But uh, for uh, but uh, the intention of most ongoing projects is about detecting uh, child pornography. But there's one thing missing, which is uh, the identification of the subject or the victim from uh, those uh, images. That's one thing missing. So, uh, currently, uh, one challenge, uh, and that also uh, indicates one of the challenges. Uh, identif identifying pedophile is not enough. We uh, can take a further step to identify the victims from uh, the images. And uh, that's one thing we are currently kind of doing. And the one possibility uh, is to use the technique I uh, presented uh, two days ago, which is about uh, identifying the source device of those images, and then link the device to the perpetrators. But uh, as I mentioned, that uh, there are also quite some technical uh, limitations to the technique I uh, presented uh, the other day. Therefore, uh, a technical challenge is to, instead of using just one type of uh, fingerprint to identify the source devices, 
we use a state or a vector of fingerprints. That means that uh, we can uh, take different form of uh, signals from the content of the image in order to identify the source device. But that leads to another technical challenge. How are we going to fuse different modality of data? So that's one thing uh, for the uh, scientists uh, to deal with. And uh, another thing is to, uh, to identify the victim. There are some, uh, they are maturing uh, techni uh, biometrics techniques such as uh, face detection, ear detection uh, techniques, which can be used to identify uh, the victim. But uh, it hasn't been uh, approached uh, very seriously, mainly because of the resolution or the quality of the images. So that's another thing uh, we can do in the future. Thank you. Since uh, the discussion sort of shifted the, uh, towards, uh, uh, towards tools, I, I'm going to jump ahead in what I, what I had in mind and actually you know, ask each and every member of the panel, so what sort of functionality would you like to see out of the, let's say, next generation tools for forensics uh, to have so that they, they will help investigators uh, into uh, their analysis of forensic incidents? I would uh, expect tools that uh, we support the selective uh, collection of data instead of collecting all the data because you know that uh, the problem when you have uh, a case is that uh, in the most of the cases you collect uh, the, 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 the biggest deal of the collect data and unrelated to the case. So we need uh, techniques that uh, would spot the most related data of the case and uh, this way the investigator will collect only this data. Uh, other issues and uh, uh, other uh, functionalities that to um, the tools should allow only authorized uh, investigators or people to do it. To, 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 to have access to the real data. Uh, these are two things. And I think from your perspective, the uh, legal perspective? Um, from the legal perspective, uh, I think that data retention uh, is, a very, is, very, is a very important issue because a lot of uh, elements of uh, contract decays and uh, um, the ways the criminal has committed a crime uh, sometimes uh, are lost and uh, police is not able to find all this information in order to go on with this, the investigation. Uh, additionally, to what Kostadino said, uh, I think that um, in order to be um, more effective uh, with tools, I think that only authorized people uh, can have access to all these kind of tools. And, uh, and the body of uh, cybercrime unit uh, of police must be trained in order to be um, a, a, to have the expertise to deal with all such of all such kind of uh, of cyber crimes because sometimes I think in some uh, in some countries th uh, there is a lot of training in order to go on with this, in the investigation and the cooperation between the law enforcement. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I've just mentioned uh, the tools uh, uh, I wish to have uh, earlier. But another thing I would like to have, already another tool, but uh, it, it can be very useful, is the, uh, it's a database of uh, imaging devices, which is, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is just like uh, the fingerprint uh, of uh, human beings. And you might think that uh, it is probably uh, not feasible because uh, the lifespan of an operating device can be shorter than human beings. And there are always new uh, devices being uh, released into the market. Therefore, the database uh, will be outdated uh, one day or two days later. But actually, that is the same, uh, that's the same uh, scenario. Uh, with the uh, human uh, fingerprints, but it doesn't prevent, but uh, it doesn't prevent the place to uh, 
to maintain uh, a human fingerprint uh, database. So by the same token, we can do a similar kind of thing. But I'm not, I'm not suggesting that uh, we should have an international uh, legislation to require all uh, device manufacturers to, uh, to surrender the fingerprint of the device. It's just that we are not requiring any uh, individual to surrender their fingerprint or their iris in order for the police to uh, establish a database. Now, what I'm saying is that uh, because there are uh, interested uh, law, in law enforcement agencies out there, and uh, if some sort of collaboration can be established, then uh, through collaboration and uh, data exchange, they can establish such a database uh, gradually. For example, uh, the technique uh, I presented uh, the other day uh, is relatively new, but actually we have been approached by uh, New South Wales Police in Australia and Felix Gendarmerie and a number of British uh, police forces uh, wanting to use uh, our technique. That means, that indicated that there are definitely uh, strong interest in using this set of tools. But by using those tools, they can establish such a database region through international collaboration. I think uh, if I were to come from an organizational perspective rather than perhaps a law enforcement perspective, um, I can look at it in terms of kind of two different problems. Firstly, the data collection issue itself. So obviously with any organization, if you're going to start to mandate the collection of all the data that goes across the network so that reactively you go back in and then you start to analyze it when you think an incident's happened, then there are a number of issues about what you're storing, how much you're storing, how long you can store it for, and privacy issues with regards to the information you're storing about the individuals, and a whole variety of other things that unfortunately, they're all kind of standard type problems that the organization itself has to, has to go through. Um, the other aspect then is, is once you know that and you can identify the, 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 the information you're looking for is what tools can help you analyze and visualize that information better. Um, and I think whilst you obviously, from a friend's perspective, need to be able to dig down to the raw data, um, we need to start developing tools that are kind of layering it up and get a better understanding of how things are operating at a higher level. So um, bringing traffic together, getting a better picture, for instance, of what an individual's activities are during a day, and so on and so forth. So rather than having to pick it out from network traffic, you get a timeline of activity that's happening in terms of what they're browsing, what they're doing in terms of network communications. Um, so I guess, you know, visualization tools, um, I have a, a couple of shoots, in fact, one in the, the media area and another one at the network area, looking at mechanisms for um, automating or, or adding intelligence into the problem. Now obviously, um, in fact we saw a paper yesterday on the, on the forensic stream about automating some forensic processes to speed up the processing. And I think whilst errors start to creep in with that kind of thing, that the idea of undertaking forensic examinations thoroughly from start to finish is pretty much gone now. They take up too much time. Law enforcement for instance, don't have the time to do it. Specifically, to give you an example of uh, the Devon and Cornwall um, High Tech Crime Unit, which is the area um, from which I'm um, in Plymouth. Their approach now in analyzing cases is very much a targeted approach. So based upon the intelligence they have, they perform an analysis. They, they don't no longer do a full analysis of the drive. There might be other stuff on there. There might be other mitigating evidence on there, but they don't actually go look for that. They, they have a very short period of time to find the evidence they're looking for, write the report, and that's it. So that's the way we're going with forensic tools, and we need to help support that um, form of working. And I think AI, uh, neural networks, and other kind of techniques like this can help us um, get out the data in a more of a in an intelligent fashion. So may I, I add another, another uh, functional requirement that in my mind uh, will be very useful in the coming years is, uh, you know, for the moment all the forensic analysis uh, is based on the, uh, on the hypothesis that uh, whatever, no matter what the society is, sensitivity or the seriousness of uh, the crime, we follow the same process. I think that this uh, has to be changed and uh, we have to uh, create tools that will take into account the sensitivity of data and the seriousness of the crime and uh, apply different levels of uh, uh, 
investigation in the, in, in the data. Okay. Um, I, I, I just I, I think the breadth of tools you talked about are very interesting. However, none of you have mentioned cloud. Is that the elephant in the room, or is it just a data storage issue? Um, as I said the, in the beginning, I think the, 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 the cloud and its applications uh, in a discovered area for the moment. Um, again, I think that selective uh, collection tools that we need there because you know uh, there are the, in the same disk you can find the same uh, uh, data concerning different tenants, different clients of the cloud. So you have to have techniques that uh, will identify the right data prior to investigation, I would say, first of all. Second, they will have the virtualization issue. You know, in the, in, the, in the court, you have to present real data. I don't know for the moment if there are some legal texts uh, which refer to virtual data are equal to the physical ones or no. Uh, you know that cloud computing virtualization is uh, one of the most uh, of the core techniques to support cloud. So in that case would be uh, equivalent to physical data if they present it in the court. There are uh, such kind of things I think that we have to consider in cloud and uh, in my opinion as I said uh, we have just now to move from the, the cloud is a new, a new thing, you know, have to deal with, and uh, many important issues like that are still open. I think I would agree. Like, it is the end of the group, and but when I think about cloud from an academic perspective, forensics, and all I see are problems and questions, and, and I don't know what the solutions are going to be, um, and it worries me the fact that you know we're moving to the cloud very, very quickly. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure many of us in this room are using cloud solutions one way or another via your iPhone or, or via private clouds. And yeah, it's an incredibly difficult problem. It's actually helping to manifest almost your first question. Kind of, it's forcing us to address that issue because of the way in which clouds operate and uh, are kind of cross cross borders. And, and yeah, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. But I certainly don't have any answers there. I'm afraid. Uh, um, there's been quite a lot of discussion about the, the, the cloud as if it's something completely new. And uh, I'm just wondering whether it is any different from websites in the sense that the way that law enforcement can currently get um, information from a website, if someone was storing something there, is they have a point of contact. Is it any different to that and should we just be building bridges between companies and law enforcement? I guess from my perspective, if I look at from a technology perspective, um, it's, it's different in the sense that you're talking about the volume of data you, and the type of data you're storing and, and also the distributed nature of it. Um, so with websites, you, you tend to maybe have um, a web server. It's likely to have one or two places where it's going to be storing data. In cloud situations and distributed load balancing, you're not always sure where any of that data actually resides. So I, I think it's just a kind of an increased level of complexity. Um, but I, I also would agree with you. I think it is also about building the connections and boundaries in a, uh, the, the connections with different people to, to establish that link into that, that kind of data. Um, but it's, you know, I'm just going back to John's question, is it, it, John's question as well, is, so whose responsibility is it in, in many respects? You know, is it the cloud provider's responsibility to liaise with the law enforcement or liaise with the organisation to perform those kind of, um, those types of jobs? Because there are costs associated with that. Um, so it's about who has access to the data, whose responsibility they, it is. They also it's have legal obligations. Those, those companies will also have legal obligations, and if they're served with... Yes, yeah, of course. So, again, I, I guess because I come from a slightly less um, law enforcement, more organisational perspective, I'm thinking more in terms of how organisations would respond to incidents and manage that, that process. Yeah, of course, under law enforcement, they would have, um, they'd have no choice, I guess, but to, to abide to a certain degree. Um, but from an organisational perspective, you know, organisations might have their own teams want to perform this kind of analysis, but don't actually have physical access to the data to do that. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's it's just more more complex than it was previously, and increasingly more complex as we, we, we go on with technology. Okay, so 
you guys have been talking about uh, privacy and tools and whatnot. Uh, and, and from what I understand, it, what you mean is that if, if you get someone's you know, desktop or laptop or, what, or whatever, you want to be able to you know, investigate them for child pornography but not be able to see other things. That's what I get from, what, from, from the discussion, right? So, you know, if, if they have social security, if they have their social security number and their credit card number on their PC, you know, the investigator should not get access to that. That's that's the impression I get from the discussion. Uh, if you have a, a physical investigation and you investigate someone's home, you'll, you'll you'll bump onto their financial documents and whatnot. Uh, so, is there any fundamental difference between the virtual world and the physical world? Are there? I mean, should we just you know uh, rely on the um, on the laws to you know, do the separation and not actual tools that do the separation between uh, uh, evidence and uh, other data? Uh, to answer your uh, question, I think, uh, yes, uh, there are uh, techniques to uh, protect uh, privacy to some uh, extent, but uh, unfortunately, I think there is no uh, one for all uh, cures to uh, this question. And uh, personally, I think that uh, protecting uh, privacy requires regulation, legislation, uh, and uh, legislation. Not just a, uh, it's not just a, a technical issue. Technically, we can have the so-called uh, privacy-enabled technology, but uh, technology has uh, has its uh, specialty. Uh, uh, specificity. That means that uh, techni technology is usually developed uh, with an aim objective. That that comes from what I I mentioned earlier that there is no one for all uh, cures to the problem. So, uh, for example, uh, people are now uh, researching ways of authenticating uh, messages based on the encrypted data so that we don't have to decrypt uh, the data before we carry out the authentication. So that is a typical, that's a typical uh, privacy uh, preserving or, or, pre uh, or privacy enabled uh, uh, technology. But this kind of technology is aiming at a specific context authentication. Okay, so I, I think technically Technically, uh, there are solutions for each smaller problem. But at a higher level, I think the regulation, legislation uh, is important, but I don't know how we can achieve that. Uh, the tools and the ways um, people from police and uh, law, enforcement, law enforcement agencies uh, try to collect all the elements in order to, uh, to catch the, the criminal uh, has to comply with legal issues, has to comply with the legislation, which is different in, in, uh, in different countries. And this is, the, this is the most important issue I said uh, at the beginning. Um, the, the major problem, especially in Greece, has to do with the license that the public prosecutor has uh, in order to withdraw the confidentiality of communications. So, uh, what we need, especially in Greece and uh, uh, I, there, there is also a similar problem in other countries of Europe, and not only Europe. Uh, we have to, um, uh, to, to to complete all these gaps that have to do with the legislation because uh, all the tools and all the technology used in order to cut the, the criminals have to do and uh, always they find in front of uh, their investigation this problem. They have the elements but they can't use the elements in courts or in order to find uh, um, all, all the details uh, that are essential in order to, uh, to have um, a good um, re result in the, in the investigation. Any comments on privacy and tools and uh, regulation? The general comment is that I think that the most uh, at least in European, I think that there is this uh, proportionality concept that whatever you do, especially in uh, investigating, you have to collect all the data related to, to the case.
we have to minimize the, the part of data that are uh, unneeded or unrelated in the, in the case. So this uh, concept also applies to data privacy. You know? So I think that uh, this general uh, legal requirement may lead us, may lead the, the academia to produce tools that support this idea of the proportionality uh, concept. Because as I, said, as I said, we have to select only the data that are needed in each particular investigation. Okay, I want to change gears now um, and ask you, I mean, you guys are, say, security experts from uh, your individual perspectives, from the legal point or the technical point. Uh, how is your interface with law enforcement? Unfortunately, we don't have someone from law enforcement here, but in your interactions, possible interactions with law enforcement, do we speak the same language? We have uh, a daily contact with uh, law enforcement in Greece. Um, in order to, uh, to protect children and to go on with the procession of uh, our reports we receive uh, uh, every day, um, we have a cooperation with uh, the cybercrime unit of the Greek police. We forward them all, all the cases needed, uh, uh, satisfied as illegal, um, in order to, uh, to go further in their investigation. And uh, at, the, uh, at the same time, uh, because the reports we forward them uh, are confidential, we don't uh, um, forward to the police all the personal details that we have from the user, from the reporter. Um, uh, say, try and keep the confidentiality uh, of the reporters. And uh, in, in this case, we try to have a communication between uh, uh, the police and the person who reported us the content. We try to keep them in touch in order to have more and more uh, elements uh, that police need uh, to go on. Um, at the moment we have uh, signed a memorandum of understanding and um, since 2003 our cooperation I think is uh, very effective and we try to keep it in uh, such level in the future as well. Um, as I said before, uh, um, to the meetings that the Hope organizes uh, for, uh, between uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, we, uh, our police participates to them with us. So um, this uh, is a kind of a, um, a very useful uh, preparation in the future as well. So we do speak the same language. Yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, comments from the others as uh, panelists, maybe? Okay. Uh, although, um, I think that the privacy is not on the primary concern of the law enforcement for the moment, at the moment. At the moment. Uh, I think the confidentiality of the investigation is the primary issue uh, of the law enforcement authorities. And uh, I think that uh, some kind of awareness in terms of privacy of the victim or the suspect has to be also taken into account. I guess just a, a brief comment to make really from my own personal experience. So, so my history and um, primarily is from information security and it's only in the last six years I've gone into towards forensics. And I've always felt those two domains are kind of quite complementary and kind of fit together quite nicely. But during my liaisons, if you like, with, with the local police officer, uh, forensic investigators, I, I found that it's actually quite different. Um, they find security is almost an uh, adversary against forensics, and they see it, security is being used as techniques for, for minimising the amount of artefacts and information they can get. So, um, you know, I find it quite interesting that they actually don't like security because obviously we encrypt the data, we tell people that forensic wipe stuff, and so on and so forth, and this is all this kind of rich information they're be looking for. So whilst we do speak the same language, um, I think there are kind of almost two competing areas. There's, there's one to protect um, data, privacy, and, and everything else, and there's almost the, the, the forensic perspective of actually, yeah, well, we don't really want to hide all that information. That's exactly what we're looking for. Um, there was a nice example. Um, I was attending a forensics conference in Orlando last year where they, they made this comment. This was shortly after, in the news, um, it came out about the iPhone storing backup, uh, backup data of everything you did. 
um, in literally months worth of data about who you called, where you went, all stored on hard drives. And uh, a UK based researcher made this public, and subsequently Apple, um, because of privacy, reduced that to a seven day window, and so on and so forth. And all the forensic, American forensic examiners that were there are all commenting, we've known about this for years, it's been fantastic. <laughs> we've kept it secret because that's the data we're after. Whereas from a security practitioner's perspective, you know, we go find that out and then we publish it straight away to, to make people aware that this kind of stuff's happening. So there are kind of slightly competing areas, but um, I think technology-wise we, we do very much speak the same language. Uh, I think uh, speaking in uh, the same language uh, is uh, important. But talking about the same thing uh, is uh, it's equally important. And I think uh, for a lot of you who have uh, in, uh, who have involved in uh, the European uh, research project uh, might have already noticed that actually the EC uh, is facilitating uh, people from different sectors to speak in the same language and talk about the same thing. Therefore, you might have noticed that in your research, in your grant proposal, if you don't, if uh, the LinkedIn uh, scientist doesn't include the end user. Uh, the the industrial partner and uh, the researchers. Then, for most of the uh, grant proposals, the chance of getting a grant uh, is very low. That means the EU is very serious about getting people to talk about the same thing, getting people to know each other's limitation and each other's uh, expectation in order to achieve the same objective. So I think language is important, and talking about the same thing is also important. Um, yeah, I, I think that um, law enforcement and academics are kind of speaking in the same language, and you guys obviously are bringing your perspective there as well. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that academics move quickly enough to um, keep up with what law enforcement need, and I think certainly um, companies are reacting a lot quicker, and I was just wondering if you, anyone has any suggestions about how we as academics can try and keep up so that we are keeping pace with law and what law enforcement need, because I don't think we are. Uh, one of my uh, current projects uh, is actually uh, a, a knowledge transfer uh, project under uh, military uh, action. And uh, the requirement is that we have to have uh, universities and, and, and SMEs or uh, law enforcement or the, uh, the end users participating in the project. And the main research activity is not only uh, scientific discovery. Although we have, uh, post, uh, we have postdocs to do uh, knowledge discovery uh, tasks, but the, the main activity is she comments. Therefore, uh, in our project, we have two universities and two uh, MSc uh, in, in three different European countries. And we have to she count uh, our researchers to, uh, from the university to the SME. And the, each she comment requires at least uh, two, two months. Uh, at the host uh, at the hosting uh, institution, so I think uh, this kind of uh, knowledge transfer is a very useful uh, mechanism for uh, for kind of uh, shortening the commercialization of technologies. So I do agree that uh, the academics are not keeping uh, pace uh, with uh, the uh, real world needs, but we do need a similar kind of uh, mechanism to facilitate that. Thank you. Okay, let's all thank our panelists.